So it's now my pleasure at this point to welcome Dr. Jennifer Fried, who joins us this evening to discuss what she has called institutional courage. That is the ability of organizations to both do harm and to respond to the damage that they sometimes do in productive ways. We're hosting this talk tonight in conjunction with Titan, TU's Institute of Trauma, Adversity, and Injustice. And I'll say that we were initially drawn to Dr. Fried's innovative work in this area by Professor Lisa Cromer from our own Department of Psychology, who actually, uh, her direct, uh, Dr. Fried was her dissertation director. And as soon as we proposed this program, uh, Dr. Cromer actually sits on our board of directors. This was one of the very first names that was proposed to us and thus one of the very first programs that we put together for the fall. So we're very excited about this uh, and are excited about the ways in which this talk in particular will help set the tone for much of what will come in the year ahead. So this is therefore something of an intellectual homecoming and also an opportunity for our campus and our community to think about courage in a creative way and a way in particular that stretches across departments disciplines and fields of expertise. Dr. Fried is herself a distinguished and innovative researcher who received her PhD from Stanford and serves as professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. She's published widely in the fields of trauma studies, sexual abuse, memory, and courage. She's published numerous scholarly articles as well as three books, including Blind to Betrayal, Why We Fool Ourselves, We Aren't Being Fooled. And her talk this evening will focus in particular on sexual violence and the ways in which institutions can counter their own blindnesses and failures in this area through transparency and accountability. I should add that Professor Fried will also be holding a more free-flowing and informal conversation tomorrow with TU faculty and students. Um, so this will be a oriented almost entirely toward the campus. If you'd like to join that event and you happen to be a student or faculty member at TU, please contact either the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities or Titan, and we'll make sure you get the information about how to join that session tomorrow. Now, before we begin, I also want to give you just a quick uh, orientation to how things will work this evening. You're, as you've noticed when you came into the room this evening, your microphones were muted and they will remain muted throughout the event to make things easier and to make communication clearer. Um, but we've also made the chat window available to open it op and open to everyone. So if you click on the bottom of your screen, if you haven't been using Zoom regularly, you'll find there's a feature called chat. If you click on that, uh, it'll open a window in which you can post questions or comments throughout the course of the talk. And in fact, we encourage you to interact with that chat window throughout the talk. Um, that conversation will be moderated by members of the OCH staff who will be monitoring it. Uh, and we'll also use that forum in order to do our uh, Q&A session this evening. So we won't be turning on the mics for Q&A. That just creates more technological wrink wrinkles. Uh, so if you have questions that come up at any time during this evening's conversation, again, just post them in the chat and I'll be moderating the Q&A based on your comments uh, at the end of this evening. Okay. Um, we do want to remind you as well that that chat feature is visible to everyone. Um, so make sure that the things that you post uh, are you know, keep in mind that they're going to be visible by the entire group that's here. And so we want to make sure that that conversation remains focused and respectful. So with that in mind, with all of that said, I'd now like to turn this evening over to Dr. Jennifer Fried uh, and thank her for joining us at the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities. I know we can't offer you the usual round of applause that we would when you would come into the room, but uh, we, we're offering our virtual applause as we welcome you this evening. So welcome, Dr. Fried. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be invited for this and so appreciative of all of you for your time and attention and um, especially delighted to be sharing this evening with Lisa Cromer, who is just such an incredibly valued colleague to me. Um, so I am going to now share my screen, I hope, and um, I've got some slides. Um, that I would like to share with you is that uh, I will assume that these are visible. Let me know if for some reason they're not visible. So my talk today is going to be in five short chapters. And these chapters will, will coincide with something of an intellectual journey I've been on now for, for more than 30 years. I'll be starting with a theory that I first began to develop around 1990, betrayal trauma theory and related the concept of betrayal blindness. I'll then tell you about a, a somewhat more recent concept that we've been working with institutional betrayal 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about some things we've learned from studying these issues on campus and also research on the nature of disclosure when people do talk about very difficult events and then conclude with the concept of institutional courage as well as the ways that I'm pivoting my own career now in order to try to bring institutional courage to the world. The trail trauma theory, I first, as I mentioned, started to develop in the early 1990s. And it was really initially, a, um, my entry into this whole domain was through the topic of memory. I was, at the time, focused on human memory. My training had been in, in human memory. And there was an increasing media attention to something that I had not really learned about in school when I was learning about memory, but seemed really important. And an example is captured by this New York Times article in, in which it, um, the author said, Frank Fitzpatrick began remembering having been sexually molested by a parish priest at age 12. Mr. Fitzpatrick's retrieval of the repressed memories began, he said, when I was feeling a great mental pain. Mr. Fitzpatrick slowly realized that the mental pain was due to a betrayal of some kind and remembered the sound of heavy breathing. Then I realized I'd been sexually abused by someone I love, said Mr. Fitzpatrick. But it was not until two weeks later that he suddenly remembered the priest, the Reverend James R. Porter. So I started with a research question in 1991, which was, why and how would individuals remain unaware or forget traumas they'd experienced? And also a, a closely related question of why are some traumas forgotten and others not? And the answer I proposed, I called the trail trauma theory. And I focused initially on both mechanisms. I was a kind of psychologist after all, and also motivations. And I'll be talking to you today about motivations, which I actually think is the more interesting question. And, and the question here is why? Why would we forget something important? We are memory machines. We shouldn't be forgetting important things. So the crux of my theory and an attempt to answer this asks you to hold two things in mind about humans and our way in the world. The first thing is our sensitivity to betrayal. We have an ability to evaluate the trustworthiness of others. And this is really good because it's highly important to our survival. We're a very social species. We interact with people in the, in the form of what you might call social contracts. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. And most of the time, these contracts are implicit. Sometimes they're explicit as a, a marriage contract or buying a house. The nature of a social contract is that you can be cheated. Uh, you can give your, your pay your cost and not get your reward. And cheating and, um, or otherwise known as betrayal is extremely expensive to us. So it behooves us to be sensitive to this and then take protective action. What are those protective actions we take? We, um, when we can, we uh, confront or we withdraw. We tell the person who's betrayed us not to do that again, or we say, I'm done with this relationship. This is so much a part of our life that if you think about literature and art, it's just full of it. If you think about the national political scene, it's just full of it. It's, it's we get betrayed and we confront or we withdraw. And that's what we do when we're empowered for good reason. There's something else though about us, which is we're highly dependent on others for caregiving. And this is at its extreme in infancy, humans are born in, in a sense, biologically premature, a human baby can't do anything and is highly dependent on caregivers. The human childhood is long and protracted and involves years and years of caregiving. The nature of caregiving is an asymmetric distribution of resources. It's really difficult and expensive for an adult to take care of a baby. The, the, as, as motivated as a parent or caregiver might be, ultimately that person's going to need some kind of reward to keep the system going. And this is known as the attachment system. And you can see this baby's making really cute facial expressions and probably cooing sounds. We are evolved to find this extremely rewarding 
And this, this behavior will encourage the caregiver to continue to devote enormous resources. The way this, um, this relationship is experienced is the emotion of love. It's, it's not reciprocal in the sense that the resources of the material resources are going in one direction, but it is reciprocal in the emotional sense that the baby's doing all sorts of things to engage in the relationship. And a baby that can't do this is really in trouble. Even, mo even mature motivated parents are gonna have a hard time giving enough attention to a baby that cannot make eye fixation, cannot make sound, cannot coo. To varying degrees, our dependence co continues throughout the lifespan. And sometimes it's really obvious, like when we're ill, but we never are entirely away from it. It's an American thing to try to sort of think we can be independent, but I think we see all the time that we're, if, if nothing else, dependent on the infrastructure around us and very often dependent on others in relationship to us from our workplace to our intimate life. What happens when you put this this ability to detect betrayal and strong reaction together with dependence, it can create a terrible bind when the betrayer is the caregiver. Because in that situation, the response of withdrawal and confrontation is very dangerous to the dependent person, um, to the person being mistreated because that response is likely to send away the caregiver and risk the survival, survival of that person. So it's in this situation where the, the abuse or mistreatment or betrayal is coming from the caregiver or the person with more power or the person for, for, with whom we are dependent, that it can become advantageous to become unaware of the betrayal. Why? Because by being unaware of the betrayal, we can stay engaged in a necessary relationship. And unawareness and forgetting in this way can be understood as an adaptive response to betrayal. And in fact, as an important survival skill. There's clear short run advantage, but we have lots of reasons to, to know that there's also a long run cost in this sort of unawareness. This theory um, suggests that there may be two primary dimensions of traumatic events. Historically, trauma has been understood in terms of terror and fear-inducing and life-threatening aspects of events, such as automobile accidents and violence and war and hurricanes. Social betrayal is a dimension that emphasizes the reaction of other humans to each other. And it can be both in the moment of an event such as abuse by a caretaker, and it can be in the aftermath of an event, so that a hurricane, which might start out as a natural disaster, can turn into a social betrayal when the government that is charged with taking care of people fails to do so. The research question that we formed back in the 90s from looking at things this way was really a question of would these two different dimensions of events lead to certain kinds of symptoms and could we pull them apart? Could we study the social betrayals separately from the terror fear inducing aspects of events? And the answer was we did, we did do, figure out ways to do that. I don't have time to go into detail, but maybe in the question period, if you want to know more about how we did that. What we found over 20 years is that high betrayal when holding, constant to some extent how much terror is involved in the situation but varying how much betrayal is associated with increases in all sorts of perplexing symptoms so not only forgetting unawareness and not telling but also depression anxiety shame ptsd dissociation physical illnesses hallucinations self-harm problematic substance use and re-victimization we also found that women and girls are at higher risk than men and boys of the exposure to betrayal trauma. So it's really toxic and it's gendered. Starting about 10 years ago, we turned our focus to what I call institutional betrayal. And the question was, can institutions be the betrayers? And when they 
that if they can, can there be blindness for institutional betrayal? Now, there was a hint of that in my slide earlier when I had as an example of a kind of event with high social betrayal, the Holocaust. The Holocaust is institutional. It's something the whole government um, did to a segment of the population. But the question was, um, can we also study this? And first we needed to define institutional betrayal. The very broad definition is institutions harming those dependent on the institution. And this includes the failure to prevent or respond supportively to wrongdoings within the institution when there's reasonable expectation of protection. So it's both over actions like Holocaust, genocide, and and this failure to prevent or respond supportively. Note that so many of our institutions do imply a, an expectation of protection. They exist for protection, law enforcement, hospitals, and schools often um, convey that they will protect as well. So can betrayal, trauma, and blindness occur in response to institutional betrayal? And can we measure this? Our first empirical focus was educational institutions. Carly Smith, then a new graduate student in the year two, 2010, came into my lab very determined to figure out a way to measure this. In our first study, we measured sexual assault experiences, trauma symptoms, and a new measure of institutional betrayal. And in order to measure institutional betrayal, we made essentially a checklist. We don't ask people, were you betrayed by an institution? Just as when we measure sexual assault, we don't ask people, were you sexually assaulted? I mean, we might ask them that because we might be interested in how they use the label. But if we want to find out if they've had a sexual assault experience, we describe it behaviorally because a lot of times people won't use the labels that fit what have happened to them. The same thing for institutional betrayal. We describe um, what we, we consider institutional betrayal in behavioral Form. So an example from our measure is not taking proactive steps to prevent this type of experience where this type of experience in this case would have been sexual assault in the context of the institution. All the way to covering up the experience and even punishing you in some way for ha from having had this experience. What did we find? Well, we found as other researchers had high rates of sexual assault within the context of institutions as well as a relationship between the quantity or amount of sexual assault and symptoms. So in this case, you see uh, the quantity of sexual assault on the x-axis and anxiety on the y-axis. And as you get more sexual assault, you get more anxiety. But importantly, when institutional betrayal is present, that relationship is exacerbated. That is, institutional betrayal is adding harm over and above the interpersonal violence that people had experienced. We see a similar pattern when we look at physical health problems. Again, even when controlling for the inter interpersonal behavior, betrayal traumas. So this includes um, problems such as sleep difficulties, breathing problems, pain, dizziness. Some researchers working with military sexual trauma survivors in the VA system compared those military sexual trauma survivors who'd had institutional betrayal in addition to military sexual trauma with those that had had the military sexual trauma without institutional betrayal. And they found that institutional betrayal was associated with PTSD symptoms, depression, and alarmingly higher odds of attempting suicide. And I really want to emphasize that because I have come to um, belief based on this sort of laboratory data, as well as many case studies that institutional betrayal can be a matter of life and death. Institutional betrayal is also costly for institutions. We know that there's more disengagement from the system, more illness, absenteeism, turnover, loss of potential workforce, talent, internal rot, corruption, and in many cases, the eventual collapse of the institution. Whether there'll be a reputational cost really depends on the societal context. Right now, when institutions get found out, there sometimes is a reputational cost and sometimes isn't. It really varies quite a bit. But even without that reputational cost, it is costly in the long run to the institution. 
There's also indication of institutional betrayal blindness or blindness for institutional betrayal. We found in one study that when there's been institutional betrayal exposure for individuals who then stay in the institution, this is associated with dissociative symptoms, which include unawareness and forgetting. Again, even when controlling for interpersonal betrayal trauma exposure. In other words, people who have been betrayed in their institution and stay are more likely to have symptoms of unawareness and forgetting. There are many more findings of, um, in the domain of institutional betrayal. And if you're interested, you can find them on my website by um, going to Googling institutional betrayal and my name, you'll find them. I wanna just say one more thing about institutional betrayal and it's just a note about our vulnerability. I um, sometimes uh, think about our relationship to institutions a little bit like my relationship to snakes. So I happen to love boa constrictors. I think they're beautiful and they're wonderful pets. And more than anything else, I love boa constrictors because when I handle them, they hug me. And they're even a big boa constrictor is way too small to swallow a full-size adult. So they're not actually a danger in that way. The, the hug of a boa constrictor feels awfully good, but it feels good to me because I am a mammal and a human who interprets hugs as a sign of affection. From the boa constrictor's perspective, I'm probably just a warm tree. They're cold blooded and they're gonna soak up warmth when they can get it. It's very unlikely a boa constrictor with its pea-sized brain and its non-social nature actually feels any kind of love for me. But I can't turn off my affection for my pet snakes. I love them even if they don't love me back. And that's the thing to think about with institutions. You, as a human being, can love an institution, but an institution can't love you back. It doesn't have the ability to love people who might love you back in the institution, but it does mean, because you can love the institution, that you are vulnerable to the betrayal at the psychological level of an institution. So when your school, government, church, or, um, or hospital betrays you and you have a strong emotional attachment to that institution, that puts you at high risk for institutional betrayal. A few lessons from some research on campus. We've done a number of surveys and these surveys started in part in response to a crisis on our campus in the year 2014 when it came to light that a gang rape had been reported and it involved athletes and two months had gone by and the athletes had been sent to NCAA championship games and it seemed nothing was going on. And when students found out, they made the understandable uh, conclusion that the university cared more about the, athlete, the success of the athletic program and the reputation of the university than the safety of the student. And there was a lot of protest it turned into a crisis for the administration and it became clear to me that the university was finally going to start to make some changes on its sexual assault policy that actually i've been advocating for for some time but they hadn't really taken seriously but now they were in a crisis and they were going to make some changes and they were going to do it in a way that was at that time lacking data so my lab and i decided that we needed to collect data from the campus and we quickly created a a campus-wide sexual violence survey and rolled it out in a summer. And we learned a lot of things. Um, there was a lot of resistance from the administration, but they eventually did use our data um, and supported and funded a second survey about a year later. And our second survey included graduate students. And I want to just tell you something we learned from this second survey. So we measured lots of things, but I, I want to emphasize um, one comparison. If we look at undergraduate rates of victimization and we compare male and student, male and female students, we see what other researchers have seen, which is that female undergraduates are at much higher risk for sexual violence of all sorts, from completed penetration without consent all the way to sexual harassment. And these are highly statistically significant differences. There is victimization among our male students, note, that's just higher in every case among our female students. But what's interesting is when we look at, at our graduate students, when we look at our graduate students, again, we see a higher risk for our female graduate student, 
students that are male graduate students, but you may note that there's a difference in the pattern of what sorts of events people are most at risk for. So this last slide on, from these studies compares now just for female students, undergraduates to graduate students. And now when you see a bunch of stars, it means it's statistically significant com comparing undergraduates to graduate students. And what this slide shows is that our undergraduates are at risk for almost every kind of sexual violence at higher rates than our graduate students, with one exception. And that's sexual or gender-based harassment by faculty and staff. And here, graduate students are at higher risk. And the, the lessons in this, I think, are important. One is that it's a story of opportunity. Undergraduates live together and they're going to parties and graduate students tend not to, to the same degree. But at the same time, graduate students are working very closely with faculty and staff and are much more likely to be in a vulnerable position relative to those faculty they're working with. So it's opportunity in a physical sense, but it's also opportunity in the sense of power. We also found that even controlling for every other form of victimization and graduate students that were harassed by faculty and staff had felt more less safe, they had more trauma symptoms, they had more experiences of institutional betrayal. One could even say that sexual harassment by faculty and staff is itself a kind of over institutional betrayal. Finally, from these surveys on campus, we see that in addition to gender, race and sexual orientation are risk factors for both sexual assault and institutional betrayal. So for some students, this is double and triple jeopardy. I believe interpersonal and institutional betrayal actually is part of the maintenance of the power structure. And this is probably why there is so much resistance to change. Because while people will say, oh, I don't want I don't want to have sexual assault on my campus and I don't want to have institutional betrayal, getting people to actually change the way they're doing things is really hard. A brief word now about disclosure in DARVO. So all of these discussions of trauma depend in some sense on people telling you what happened to them. And it turns out, and I'm sure you know, that people are very reluctant to describe their exposure to trauma. So this creates a terrible problem because without reporting, it's difficult to stop the assault and harassment. Reporting is really rare. For instance, only 6% of those sexually harassed graduate students reported the harassment to university sources. That means 94% did not report it to anyone in the university. When we look at undergraduates, and we ask if they've reported a different sample. We have 512 undergraduates surveyed. Of them, 189 had experienced sexual victimization on campus, yet only 50 had told anyone at all. And who had they told? Friends and family members. They'd hardly told anyone at the university. Why don't victims report? Well, reporting can lead to a good outcome, but reporting is actually extremely risky because a bad response makes things worse for the victim. And we know this from research. A bad response, in fact, can be a new betrayal trauma. And when the bad response is from the institution, it's actually is institutional betrayal and in how we've been measuring it. Harmful responses are uh, include some obvious harmful responses like blaming and validating and punishing, but also less obvious harmful responses, such as not acknowledging, changing the topic, minimizing reassurances, turning the discussion to the self, and taking away control from the survivor. And this is all um, backed by quite a bit of research. There's a bit of good news in um, some of our studies we found that when people are well-intentioned but don't know how to respond well, they can become much better listeners through education. And if you're interested, I have on my website tips and discussion guides for some of that education. I want to also make one note about mandatory reporting. So many universities have mandatory reporting policies. And this concerns me a lot because mandatory reporting is basically taking control away from victims. And we know from research taking control is one of the mo most harmful things that victims can experience. Um, we also have reason to believe mandatory reporting actually chills reporting um, and doesn't lead to the positive outcomes people hope. If you're interested in this topic, I also have um, a, a resources on my website. If you Google compelled disclosure in my name, you will find them. And I have um, 
have come up with with my colleagues an alternative reporting model that we have also posted on that same page in which we have students tell us rather than we tell students, students tell us what they want to have happen with our information. A particularly pernicious response to disclosure is one I call DARVO, and that is an acronym for Deny, Attack, Reverse, Victim, and Offender. So deny, it never happened, attack, you're a liar, it's an attack on the credibility of the person making the accusation, and reverse victim and offender, this is when the perpetrator takes the victim role. You may um, reflect on the hearings for the last Supreme Court nominee and the nature of that discussion, as well as many other highly public examples of what happens when people are accused of or held accountable for mis misdoings, particularly sexual misbehavior. And um, you may recognize this DARVO response. Our research indicates that DARVO is um, is associated with victim self-blame. In other words, it's an effective strategy for a perpetrator because victims blame themselves. When victims blame themselves, they're more likely to also be silent. We also have found that when third parties experience a DARVO um, coming from the accused perpetrator, they're more likely to doubt the victim's credibility. Again, showing DARVO is an effective strategy. The good news is that if we educate people about DARVO, it appears to reduce its power to discredit the victim's credibility. And because of this finding, this education finding, I, um, I urge people to recognize DARVO and identify it in order to de defang it. There is a form of DARVO I call institutional DARVO, and that's when the DARVO is committed by an institution or with institutional complicity, such as when police charge rape victims with lying. Dar institutional DARVO is a form of institutional betrayal. I, I don't have time to play this for you now, but one of those moments in my career that was the most surreal was waking up one morning and getting lots of emails saying, your concept was on South Park last night. And um, it was a 90 second clip that South Park ran in its finale episode. And they really did actually understand and get DARVO. So again, you can, uh, I recommend it's pretty funny. Um, you can Google DARVO South Park, I'm sure you'll find it. Okay, last chapter, institutional courage. And this brings me up to the, the present. Um, it's, so the question that was bothering me a lot as we were finding out how powerfully harmful institutional betrayal is, is whether there's something we can do to pre prevent it. And I know, and I experienced this myself, and I just experienced it this week, it's really tempting to drown in the pain of betrayal. Or alternatively, to succumb to betrayal blindness and say everything's fine. But neither drowning in the pain nor the betrayal blindness actually helps prevent the abuse or the betrayal. They might get you through the moment, but they don't actually change things. In order to change things, we need to have hope, awareness, and action. And this is where institutional courage comes in. So the definition, our working definition for institutional courage is that it's an institution's commitment to seek the truth and engage in moral action, despite unpleasantness, risk, and short-term cost. It's a pledge to protect and care for those who depend on the institution. And it's a compass oriented toward the common good of individuals and institutions and the world. It's a force that transforms institutions into more accountable, equitable, healthy places for everyone. I've identified 10 steps to promote institutional courage. This is not meant to be the final word, um, and I'm sure it's not exhaustive, but uh, it's somewhere to get, get started. So one is to comply with laws that exist for protecting civil rights, but to go beyond mere compliance. Mere compliance quickly leads to a checkbox mentality that becomes counterproductive. And a closely related issue is to beware risk management mindset. It's, it's actually necessary to take risk in order to prevent and address institutional betrayal. 
Uh, another step is education. It's really important to educate at the institutional community about these concepts, about the nature of victim response, about the ways that institutions can harm. And this is especially true for leadership. Responding well to victim disclosure and creating trauma-informed reporting policies are a third step. Bearing witness, being accountable, and apologizing are, are additional steps. Perhaps my favorite step is cherishing the truth tellers or whistleblowers. This is a step that we can take relatively easily. It's just a matter of having the will to do it. But when somebody comes forward and has the courage to say what happened to them, instead of trying to shut them down or deny, it's, um, it, it's the opposite. It's holding them up and thanking them for what they're doing. When people come to institutional leaders and say there's institutional betrayal occurring in whatever words they use, they're actually doing a great favor to the institution. And it's possible to cherish and reward such people through the relatively simple act of acknowledging and thanking them. Sixth step is conducting scientifically sound anonymous surveys. For all these sorts of behaviors, people are very reluctant to speak openly about them. And it's only through anonymous survey one can really begin to know what's going on. And it's important these be done in a scientifically sound way. It's actually not a trivial matter to know how to ask these questions and how to treat the data. Equally important is regularly engaging in self-study. So people have to be willing to ask themselves if their institution's engaging in, in betraying behavior. And part of this, I think, is, is understanding that this is not about necessarily bad intention. We might have a, cases of, and we do, institutional betrayal despite people's good intention. Number eight is to be transpar transparent about data and policy. Transparency is so important because sexual violence, corruption, just about all the problematic behaviors of institution thrive in secrecy. So transparency is a powerful way to break down the betrayal. Number nine is for those of us who can to use our organization to address the societal problem. So it's not enough to fix what's in your backyard, but to try to reach out and help the larger picture. And this is really, really true for research universities. I'm appalled at how little funding and resources and energy has gone into the problems of sexual violence and discrimination and racism and institutional betrayal relative to the consequences and size of the problem. And then number 10 is none of this stuff is free. Uh, it's not super expensive, but it's not free. So it's really important to commit ongoing resources to these steps. We have begun to study institutional courage um, in one big study that was completed recently as a doctoral dissertation under my direction. Alex Smith um, and I um, surveyed a series of employees around the country in various industries, and we created a new measure, the Institutional Courage Questionnaire. What we found was Unfortunately, few institutional courage behaviors were reported by these 800 employees who had experience working in corporate America. However, when institutional courage was present, we found it buffers against both workplace sexual harassment and institutional betrayal. So in other words, an, an organization can have workplace sexual harassment, can have institutional betrayal. If institutional courage is there, the employees and the institution are doing a lot better. We also found that institutional courage is good for the institution. And this is um, kind of like the business case for institutional courage. Even if you don't care about humans and the well-being of individuals, if you're in charge of an institution, probably you have incentives to care about the institution. So it, we find it increases job satisfaction, trust and management, perceived gender equality and organizational commitment, and it reduces work withdrawal behaviors and one year leaving intentions. I want to now turn to um, a, a case study, um, one example of what institutional courage looks like. People are always asking me, are there examples? And there are examples. I haven't found an institution that's across the board just great in every way on this, but I have found examples and here's one that I like. So 
We go back to 1998, and it involves Brenda Tracy and Ed Ray, both people I know and respect. In, in 1998, Brenda Tracy reported to police that she'd been raped, gang raped at a party, and two of the accused assailants were Oregon State University football players. I should say, I've been a professor for a long time at the University of Oregon. This is a different school, Oregon State University, but it's also in Oregon, and it's a, a sim, structurally a similar kind of school. Prosecutors led Brenda Tracy to believe the case was weaker than it was. Her rape kits were destroyed and the two football players had one game suspension and community service. Um, and no one from OSU talked to Brenda Tracy. That was 1998. And Brenda Tracy went on with her life, um, despite this horrible thing that happened to her, and made as best she could a life for herself. She got a nursing degree. She raised two children. But she also suffered. She definitely suffered for a long time. Then 2014 rolled around and suddenly college sexual assault was all over the news. It was now a national conversation. And perhaps because of this, it prompted Brenda Tracy to find out what had happened to her 16 years earlier. She called Oregon State University to ask what had happened to her case. And at first they were evasive. But she had the opportunity to talk to a beloved columnist, John Canzano, at the main paper in Oregon, The Oregonian, and he wrote a column about the case. I'm sure the morning that column was published, many people forwarded it to the president of OSU named Ed Ray. Ed Ray wasn't the president in 1998, but he was in 2014. And he did something different than most institutional leaders in this situation. Rather than putting his energy into PR, covering up, denial, he put his energy into investigation. He ordered an investigation and he made sure it happened fast. Three weeks later, he met with Brenda Tracy and shared the results of the investigation. Not only that, but he wrote an apology to her letter, letter to her. Dear Brenda, Brenda, Oregon State officials are very grateful that you took time to meet with us. We're so sorry for what you experienced in 1998 and have lived with since. What we have learned recently of your suffering is heartbreaking and your bravery inspires us. We're also grateful to you for raising the public dialogue about the consequences of sexual violence in our society and raising a discussion of how society can better assist survivors of such violence. While we cannot undo this nightmare, we apologize to you for any failure on Oregon State University's part to better assist you in 1998. As promised a few weeks ago, we conducted an exhaustive review of the facts of how OSU handled this matter 16 years ago. This review was completed this past Friday, and we want to share the results of that review with you. We didn't stop there. After he apologized, Ed Ray hired Brenda Tracy to be his consultant and they worked together for two years and it led to many important innovations and changes at OSU. What does institutional courage look like? Well, you see some of the pieces here. It involved investigation and importantly, transparency. It involved acknowledging what happened and apologizing. It totally involved cherishing the whistleblower. He hired her. This led to increasing resources and awareness on campus they didn't just stop with campus. They, Ed Ray and Brenda Tracy went to the state capitol. They talked to state legislators. They supported policy changes for the state level. And there were many um, efforts that continued after this initial relationship. It was really um, a good thing that happened. So what does this show? First of all, it shows it's possible. I believe the research and the logic shows it's needed, that it's positive, that is institutional courage. But we also know from the research we've done, we have done, it's relatively rare. So what are we gonna do about that? This leads me to the last little part of this presentation, which is this pivot I've taken recently. I've founded in the last, you know, it must be nine months, yeah, January of 2020, a nonprofit, and this is very different than what I've been doing for for more than 30 years as a professor. Um, and the nonprofit's called the Center for Institutional Courage, and it's an inst it's a, an institution that's dedicated to science, education, and data-driven action, with a goal of promoting institutional courage. 
we have a fabulous board of directors and uh, a great team of researchers and advisors, some of whom are in this picture. We have um, a very ambitious mission to advance the world's understanding of institutional courage and institutional betrayal through rigorous scientific research, wide reading, reaching education and data-driven action with the goal of creating more accountable, effective and equitable institutions for everyone. And our mission is probably even more ambitious, but we want to not only be the world's foremost center for this research and education and action, but we also see a future where institutions can act courageously with accountability, with transparency, actively seeking justice and making reparations where needed despite unpleasant risk and short term unpleasantness and cost. I, I should add that you know, I, I think that we're in a period where there's great distrust of our institutions. And I suppose to the extent that's because institutional betrayal is being seen, maybe that's healthy, but it's very costly to have this level of distrust. But trust needs to be earned. And I really believe it's only through instilling courage that that trust will be legitimately earned. And it's, I believe, essential for our society and our democracy. So I end with that and thank you and look forward to your questions. All right, terrific. Thank you very much. We'll, we're, there's, there's applause resounding around Tulsa that you can't hear, but it'll travel to you virtually, uh, I hope, over the internet. Uh, that was a fascinating, compelling, and interesting talk. Uh, there's certainly a lot of, of there for us to chew on. Um, as I said at the outset, I'd like to encourage all of you who are here with us to please post your questions and comments um, and ideas in the chat uh, here beside them, uh, here beside the, the, the main window so that I can share those with Dr. Fried uh, and I'll do my best to moderate those as they come in. Uh, so please go ahead and take a moment um, to frame some of those questions and get them to us. Uh, in the meantime, I think I might get us started by asking uh, a question. I mean, it, this, this talk, it seems to me, speaks to a moment when I think a lot of us are feeling betrayed by all kinds of institutions, um, governmental, educational, police. I mean, this, it, and I, I don't think it matters where you fall in the spectrum of politics at the moment. Everyone feels like institutions as a whole are sort of faltering at the moment um, and perhaps lacking the kind of courage that you're describing. Um, so I, I wonder if you've done any work or research on the ways in which are, are certain kinds of institutions more or less responsive um, to these calls or the, the sort of structures of courage that you're describing here? Um, are schools, for example, sort of more reactive than governments or police departments? I'm just I'm wondering if there's a way to think about institutions, not just as one singular group, but as, as very different kinds of entities. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I don't really have an answer from systematic research. We just haven't done that, but I think it's a really important question. We, I, I'm going to say anecdotally, we've had more um, resonance with educational institutions than any other. And it's perhaps um, partly because educational institutions um, so have at, at the top of their mission to, to nurture and help their students and others that depend on them. Um, Although, you know, I could say the same thing in some sense for say hospitals where there's been much more, med the medical system, much more resistance as far as I can tell um, to these concepts and making changes in, in those systems. So I don't know, there may also be something to do with just the built-in economic incentives that are playing a role. I think this is a whole domain of research. And one of the reasons I really feel we need this Center for Institutional Research is this whole research arm to it. If if universities would have supported this sort of research, I it would have made sense to do it inside universities. But they they really have been very resistant for um, for putting resources into the research itself. Is this part of what you describe as that risk uh, the risk management? I thought that was a really interesting. Um... Uh, yeah. phrase that you had there that you know the importance of avoiding risk management is something that's become a sort of watchword of university life for a lot of us now uh, and that in fact that discourages certain kinds of courage and courageous action because all we do is think about what are the potential risks how do we mitigate them rather than how do we make positive you know, change. I think something that often gets a little convoluted in this too is there are 
risks all over the place. There's risks in inaction, there's risks in action, and there's short-term risks and there's long-term risks. And what's unfortunate about the risk management mindset is it's often looking at very short-term risk and it's um, risks to the institution. Often it's liability. It's often very narrow-minded uh, legal liability risk. And that the, the bigger risks may be in, 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 in not taking action that is bold and brave. Um, so, so I think part of the, the confusion here is people thinking there's only risk on one side of, of an equation when really there's risk on, on both sides. And one of my biggest concerns about universities that I've seen a shift during my years being in higher education is an increasing reliance on lawyers and general counsel to make what seem to me core mission decisions. So in my opinion, general counsel has an important role to play in identifying legal risks and reporting to administrators, but then the the president of the university or whoever has the fundamental responsibility to make a decision um, that might take the form of, of taking of being willing to incur a certain amount of legal liability in order to do the right thing for people involved in the institution. I think a perfect example was Ed Ray there. And I'm sure like his a letter, his apology letter was probably when he had to negotiate it with his lawyers a lot to even do it in the first place and then his exact wording. And you can see some compromises in there. He thread the needle quite well. And I can tell you that it was effective. It, it, it felt sincere enough. So I think that a good leader who's willing to take those risks can do it in an effective way. But I don't, you know, I don't know where, what got us to this point of excess risk management with lawyers running things. Well, and this, this leads actually, we've got several questions that are now coming into the, to the chat here. And this, this leads to the very first one that was asked, I think, actually, and you'll be delighted to know it comes from Lisa Cromer. Um, she writes that it seems like courage needs to start from the top as in, in your, your example of the Oregon State president is, is right on point here, I think. Um, so do you have ideas about how the will to be courageous can then be cultivated. Um, she's, she writes, I, or she continues, I can imagine that institutional attorneys would be worried about being courageous. So sort of what you're saying, but, but is this a sort of, I mean, we can't just put it on one good guy at, at OSU. How do we cultivate those skills? You know, how do we develop leaders that are more open to maybe to this yeah, kind of Absolutely. Uh, and I don't, it's a great question. And I wish, Lisa, Lisa, maybe you can do a project with me. Like, I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, the truth is, so much of what we need to do is raise our children in a certain way. And this is not a satisfying answer because that's not a fast fix. And it's not about, you know, how universities are functioning. It's about how we in our society are raising our kids. And I do believe that an awful lot of the ultimate solution is going to be when we're in a position to raise our kids in a different way. But how do we get to that position? And then I do think institutions have an important role to play. I mean, the next generation of parents um, includes college students that we have today. And how can we, how can we nudge them in the right direction so that when they raise their kids, their kids are more courageous individuals. Um, so I, you know, I think there's openings there. But I do want to say I gave an example of a courageous leader, um, but there are other examples that are a little different. So at the University of British Columbia a group of faculty got together and wrote a letter, uh, I think it was about 100 of them, apologizing for the university's failure in a particular case of egregious sexual harassment involving a graduate student. Now, the faculty got together and did this after the administration failed to do it. And they didn't write the letter in a way that was focused on, oh, the administration's bad. They just did this really clever thing of just saying, OK, we can be the university. We can apologize. So they did it without all that institutional power. I mean, they were faculty, but they, they took the matter into their own hands. Another recent example was in the nonprofit world, um, the, the daughter of the founder and president of a famous nonprofit had brought to the board of that nonprofit many times 
the fact that she had been sexually assaulted by her father over many years and had been constantly dismissed and that nobody wanted to hear about it because this guy was doing you know this great work for the world and very successful for the nonprofit. Um, but it was something was terribly wrong there at the same time, obviously. And what the the young woman just didn't stop raising the issue. And it came to the attention of some employees, not high level employees, relatively low level employees at the nonprofit. And they basically staged a kind of walkout about it. And it led to, once they did that, then the whole board of directors had to change their whole their whole tune. And they ended up um, apologizing and removing this person from power and so on. So it started at a grassroots level and led to that kind of institutional change. So I think like a lot of complicated problems that involve a certain amount of cyclical problem, there's probably multiple intervention points and we need to just find wherever we can find, get in and make a change. Well, it might be useful then at this point to pivot to the sort of other side of that equation, which is the people that have survived or endured institutional trauma. Um, as, as you're describing, we've got several questions here on that topic. So um, I, th I think I'll just start with the first one that came in here. This is from Nicholas McMillan, who says, are there ways that you found or would recommend to treat institutional betrayal uniquely, or at least in addition to other kinds of trauma treatment? Do we like, so in, I guess in a, in a treatment setting, do we need to think about this as a particular kind of trauma and that, that needs to be treated differently? Uh, yeah. than other kinds of trauma that we're more familiar with in well, I, settings. I should say I'm not a clinical psychologist or treating psychologist, so I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. I do know some people are starting to publish on that topic. And um, I would think at a minimum, though, w w that it would be important to acknowledge the, the uh, to sort of ask people about their experiences with institutions and when they have been betrayed to acknowledge that as, as a potential harm that they're experiencing. And one of the, the things I, I don't know if I sufficiently emphasized, um, partly because it's, it's only recently that I've really articulated this to myself, but institutional betrayal causes two kinds of harm and one kind at least, but two, two, one kind is the failure to do things in the practical material world. So for instance, let's take the example of our government's failure around COVID. It, that, I will, I will um, trail has this practical material consequence of people getting sick and dying. That, it, so that's one piece of it. But it also has separately this psychological consequence. So, um, in the sense that you have not gotten sick and you've, not, well, obviously you've not died if you're still having these thoughts, but people close to you have, have not, you've not suffered a terrible loss in your own life. You still may feel this emotional psychological cost of the betrayal from your own government that you're witnessing. Uh, you know, another example that I think a lot of us may have experienced is, is the pain of learning what's happening on our borders to kids. And we may not know anybody even in that situation, but it's this psychological pain that occurs. I, I would think in a treatment situation, it's really important to acknowledge that. So that even somebody who, who hasn't been directly affected in the material sense may still be suffering. And of course, if they have been directly affected, it's like a double whammy. Well, and here's a here's a question that I think sort of maybe pushes slightly to the to the research side of the of this same question. Um, so this is for from Meg Weinkoff. She says I'm a researcher working on an article in an HR publication to create trauma informed leadership frameworks. Have you noticed certain attitudes and behaviors and how people respond that are betrayed by an institution, particularly for people who then stay in that institution or organization? Well, there's certainly the the denial of blindness response that allows people to stay um, and you know I, I've, I've thought about this a lot in the context of people on the job who have the job of title IX coordinator so most universities have somebody with a job now title IX coordinator and I I've spoken 
been to lots of Title IX coordinators at presentations and in other settings. And a common thing I hear from Title IX coordinators is that, well, first of all, they're exhausted and their job's too hard and they're under-resourced and it's just a grueling, awful job. But also that for many of them, they feel that they are being betrayed by their institution, that they're being put in impossible situations where they they know something bad has happened to a student or staff member, but for various reasons, they're really not allowed to fully act on that. And they have to protect the institution who's paying their paycheck. So they're in this inherent conflict of interest. And it seems to me they take one of two routes. One is they kind of shut down and suck it up and become like, you know, the company, the company man or many of these, the company person. And the other is they leave the, they leave the job. They, they can't do it. So to me, that's an example where there's so much betrayal going on that it, it, you really, the only way you can stay in a lot of these positions is with betrayal blindness. That may lead to to another question here. This is from this is about your the the statistics that you showed us and the difference between graduate and undergraduate um, uh, sexual assault numbers and and how that might relate to institutional trauma. So this is from Adrena Matsai, uh, and uh, they write when discussing the difference between undergrad and grad student victimization. You said that graduate students might have the motivation of opportunity and power. So what did you mean by power? Or did we misunderstand, or did I, sorry, did I misunderstand what you said? Or did I misspeak? What I, what I meant to say is that the, the vulnerability that graduate students have is, is particular to the dependence that they have on faculty and the enormous power asymmetry. So the faculty that they're working with have so much power over them, particularly in some, depending on, you know, the particular unit and field, but in, in this, let's say, you know, in a lab science where funding and access to a future career are all going to be controlled by potentially one person. That one person then has this, this potential power that makes it really hard for the graduate student to escape the situation, do anything about it, and also really costly if there's this harassment that's going on. So that's the power piece and the opportunity. I mean, there's also the increased opportunity of more time spent together. The opportunity piece that I was trying to emphasize was that for undergraduates, their their living situation often creates so many opportunities for um, the kind of sexual, physical sexual assault they are exposed to at such an alarming rates. So uh, I'm aware that, that Zoom fatigue is a, is a real thing, so I don't want to, um, I don't want to take this too much uh, beyond the, the eight o'clock hour that we'd anticipated here, but I do have a, at least one other question that I'd like to ask. Um, and this is my English professor brain, perhaps, uh, so you'll forgive me if it sounds naive, but um, you said, uh, you, you know, you, you, you in the course of your talk, you, you use the old chestnut about institutions can't love you back, so be careful about loving them. Um, and I, I also found it really powerful what you said, you know, that, that the institution can quite easily betray you because of this sort of this fiction of love, um, but, but you can't really betray the institution. I wonder if you could just dig into that just a little bit more for us and this, this, so how do we respond, especially, I mean, you, you talked about educational institutions in particular, and these are certainly institutions I know best, but this, the rhetoric of, you know, this is, this is the university family, right? I mean, they, it seems like institutions deliberately cultivate a language of trust and, uh, and, and family and belonging that only heighten the opportunity, it seems, Absolutely. for betrayal and make anything that you might do that seems critical of the institution make you into sort of the betrayer. So there's another kind of sort of trauma that's lurking in the wings here of asking, did I accidentally betray the institution somehow or am I betraying uh, this thing that has in fact betrayed, yeah. you know, betrayed me or betrayed my colleagues. Yeah, no, and I, I would say if people can betray an institution. It, it, they, but what you're pointing to there is they also can be accused of betraying the institution when really they might have just been telling the truth about what occurred to them. Um, but absolutely, institutions play on exactly this 
this very human response we have to them. And so I, I guess what, what I really was trying to convey with that snake picture is that it, it might be okay to love something that can't love you back. And maybe it's inevitable. Like I know lots of people don't love snakes, but I can't help but loving snakes and I can't help but loving snakes that cuddle me. And it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm like, it's, it's my job to stop loving. So I don't see how I can help loving institutions that play a really important role in my life. And to not love them is just agonizing. I mean, I think that's why we're also, you know, so exhausted right now is we're having trouble loving some core institutions. And I think it's a good thing about us that we have these great big attachment systems and that they'll, they'll work towards, towards non-humans in various ways, including institutions. I don't think we should, we want to stop that. Um, but I do think it helps to be literate about it because you might notice when you're being played. And I do think that universities play us and other institutions. So, you know, I've, I've um, gone to schools myself and I've raised three kids, all of whom have gone to lots of institutions and every single institution I sit there as a parent or I sit there as a student years ago and I hear the same rhetoric about, you know, where are your family? Welcome home. You know, it's it's totally playing on that. And and there are probably some good reason, some good intentions there, but I think it's also kind of unfortunately about raising money and you know and getting people to behave. And so the people who are doing it may not realize how much they're sort of manipulating people, but what, what we can do as consumers of institutions or whatever the right word there is, is not stop having feelings, but think it through and say to ourselves, well, I really love my school, but realistically my school can't love me back. And I think that confers a certain amount of protection from some of the harm when the school does betray. And maybe gives, I mean, at least what, I'm, what you're making me think is it gives us, a, sort of reminds us that we have courage as a resource too, as a sort of individual resource to draw on to say that I can resist that. And sometimes it takes courage to say, well, if this were my home, this would not have happened. I wouldn't have been treated in this way or, um, or you wouldn't have treated my, you know, my colleague in this way. Uh, so that courage isn't just a thing that institutions can have, but it's probably useful for us to remember that we can have courage in relationship to those institutions. I mean, it's probably the same kind of courage we see in Black Lives Matter protests or, or uh, you know, other protests that are engaged with other kinds of social institutions outside of the educational field. Yeah, right and, and that's well. that, you know, since you have this theme of courage, I did, did want to mention that I've thought a lot about the words I use, and I've had people for every phrase I come up with, I have some people tell me I've come up with the wrong phrase. And I've had people tell me, betrayal's the wrong word, and courage is the wrong word. And so I've thought about it, and I don't think it's the wrong word. Like any word, it's not always perfect in every situation, but courage to me involves um, the requirement of a lot of energy and effort to overcome the fear that will otherwise paralyze. And it, why does it take energy and effort? I believe it's because of this nature of maintaining the status quo. So when you try to change things that are maintaining the status quo, especially a discriminatory one, you are going to meet resistance that's going to require energy and effort to overcome it and, and very reasonable fear that you're going to be retaliated against. And so from, from my perspective, all of this does take this very human kind of courage to make these changes. I appreciate that. This has been a, a phenomenal talk. I think this is a really heartening way actually for us to sort of lead out of it and, and for us anyway, to lead into what's going to become uh, you know, a, a year long meditation really on courage and exactly on the sort of energy and resources that you describe here to introduce change. And in fact, we have a number of people in the chat, in the chat that are thanking you for the talk. Uh, and uh, so I wanna join them in thanking you for this evening as well. It's been terrific. I wanna thank all of you who've joined us here at the OCH this evening as well. Uh, and just a reminder that our next event will be on October
October 8th at 7 o'clock. So that's two weeks from tonight when we'll be welcoming Dr. Melanie Keekley from uh, Virginia Tech University to talk about a different kind of courage, which was actually women in the 19th and early 20, late 19th and early 20th centuries coming forward to testify about um, women's health issues in particular and the ways in which, especially in public situations, they were often greeted with derision and laughter um, and how the, the courage that they had in sort of responding um, to, to, to that situation. So uh, I wanna thank you again, uh, Dr. Fried, for joining us this evening. This was a phenomenal talk. It's been a pleasure uh, to have you here with us virtually. I very much wish we could have had you here in Tulsa for these couple of days, but I'm glad you could take the, the time and energy to share your, your work and research with us. Thank you so much. Of course, and again, we're all applauding, uh, are applauding you and you'll see there's applause in the chat uh, as well. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. I hope you have a good evening. Take care of each other and of your community under these trying times.